okay so welcome to the next lecture the topic is uh, communication complexity so communication complexity is an area of computational complexity which where uh, uh, where we pay a, uh, where we place a significant emphasis on the communication costs okay and this is an interesting area and it has a lot of applications uh, so for instance uh, streaming lower bounds uh, bounds in distributed computing bounds in circuit uh, complexity uh, bound uh, results in game theory and um, uh, vlsi design uh, several other areas have used uh, results in communication complexity to obtain results in those areas okay and in fact one of the project topics listed is uh, is um, a circuit complexity lower bound depth lower bound using the communication uh, complexity framework okay so it it has wide variety of applications and and it's very interesting and the um, the mathematics involved are very uh, very neat okay so let us try to understand what this is so this was introduced by yao in 79 so basically the goal is alice and bob are two parties right alice has an input x from a capital from a domain capital x and y bob has an input y from a domain capital y and they have to compute a function which is a joint function of both x and y okay like like for instance x plus y could be the function right so we'll see some examples and now how do they together compute the function so individually alice has unbounded computation power and bob has unbounded computation power we do not try to uh, um, uh, restrict or measure the amount of time taken by alice or time taken by bob or space taken by bob or whatever because that is not of concern here or the random bits what is the only thing that is of concern is the number of the communication between alice and bob right the number of bits that has to be sent between alice and bob so that the computation is completed right so the goal is to compute f of x comma y f of small x small y small x comes from a domain capital x and small y comes from a domain capital y right so let us see so typically how could this happen one very trivial thing to do would be to for alice to send her input to bob and bob computes the function right bob can compute the function because he has unbounded power and then bob tells alice this is the function value he computes Uh, f of x y and sends f of x y. Right? This is a trivial thing, and this will work always. But this involves Alice having to send her entire input and Bob having to send the answer, or vice versa could also be done. Bob could in instead Bob could send his entire input to Alice and Alice could compute and she she could send f of x y, right? But uh, the, the 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 this this need not happen this way. Maybe there is a way for Alice to send some information. and then bob could do something with that information and maybe send some more some in other information back to alice and then alice could send something else back to bob and this could uh, go back and forth a few times right like as indicated in this figure and this could result in the computation of the function value right so such a uh, arrangement is called a protocol right so in general what is a protocol so basically alice sends what is called some function of x uh, called aix so aix is a function of x x is alice's input by the way and all the prior communication so basically whatever alice has received till now including that and the input x she computes something and sends it back to uh, sends it to bob so that is called aix so every time a, so first alice sends a one next then bob gives you b1 x b1 y and similarly bob computes b j y uh, which is b1 y b2 y etc and every uh, function that bob computes b j is is a function of the input his input y and also all the prior communication that alice has sent him and at the end now if somebody just somebody knows the protocol let's let's say somebody understands what is going on and they just see the messages that alice and bob have exchanged they should be able to tell what is a function value by just looking at the the messages that have ex been exchanged right in other words this the set of messages that have been exchanged is sometimes called the transcript so by just by looking at this transcript of these messages it should be able to 
one should be able to compute what is a function value one very easy way of doing this is to um, one very easy way of doing this is to uh, maybe make the last communication from alice or bob the function value itself so then certainly the you just look at the last step but we don't always need that right? sometimes maybe the function value can be calculated from that right but what should be certainly clear is that at the end somebody should look somebody if they are looking at the transcript should be able to un understand the function value so certainly both alice and bob are parties to all these messages right so they both should be able to compute the function value at the end of the communication protocol so this is what a what is a protocol again we'll see more uh, we'll see examples and things will be clear and um, there are many models of communication complexity like deterministic complexity randomized complexity and there are restriction on rounds uh, there are even the randomizer is one sided randomness uh, two sided randomness public coin pub private coin etc but what we will see because since this is not a course on communication complexity we'll just see the deterministic communication complexity model and uh, we'll see some simple techniques for that this is, this is just to give you an introduction to communication complexity because that's all we could do in this course right so deterministic communication complexity of a function f so f has two arguments right f of x comma y so given a protocol for a given protocol what is the cost of the protocol the cost of the protocol is the maximum communication that happens between alice and bob in in terms of number of bits right so first look at this uh, just this part number of bits that a pi is a notation used to denote a protocol right so number of uh, bits used by the protocol pi to compute f of x y and the the cost of the protocol is the maximum that it takes over all the input pair pairs it is possible that some input pairs the protocol decides very quickly and some input pairs the protocol takes more communication to uh, determine f of x y so here we take the maximum this is like this is like we 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 are usually interested in the worst case time complexity of a of of our any algorithm right let's say you have a computational problem uh, let's say sorting so you are interested in the given an algorithm you are interested in the worst case possibility which of these situations they force it to take the worst thing that is why we have a max here so max over all possible inputs and min over all the protocols so this is like of course there are there are algorithms that sort that do sorting in n square time but there are algorithms that do sorting in n, n log n time also so but then we when we say what is the complexity of sorting we are talking we talk about the minimum complexity right the, the best the so the across algorithms it is a minimum and within algorithm we want to find the worst case so just like that across protocols we want the minimum and once the protocol is fixed we want to find the worst case uh, complexity for that protocol so let's see some examples so that it will be clear so one simple example is equality what is equality equality is uh, alice and bob should be able to decide whether uh, the inputs that they hold are the same whether so equality is equal to 1 if x is equal to y and 0 otherwise so one trivial algorithm is for alice to send everything to bob and bob sends just 0 1 back right so we need this step because if bob does not send anything back it is not possible for somebody to look at the transcript and decide whether uh, the function value is 0 or 1 so bob bob can bob could also have sent y to alice but then there is it is not required to send both x to bob and y to alice instead bob could just compute the function and just send 0 1 back right so now alice knows the function value and how, what is the complexity alice sends x which is n bits and bob sets a single sends a single 0 1 bit back so the complexity is n plus 1 so d of eqn which is the comp deterministic complexity of uh deterministic complexity of uh, the equality function it is less than or equal to n plus 1 why is it less than or equal to n plus 1 because the, what i described here is just one way to compute equality function one protocol for computing equality function so uh, presumably there could be other ways to compute equality function 
and may, it, 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 it is not clear whether they will be better or not, but they could be better. As of now, we don't know better. We don't know any other way. But uh, so, so the actual uh, deterministic com complexity of equality, we know that it cannot be worse than this because we have demonstrated one protocol that computes in n plus one, uh, n plus one bits. So the best case or, or the best protocol cannot take more than this. It can take less than this. So it is at most this. Okay. Uh, the next function is parity. Parity is like you take uh, XR of all the bits in X and as well as Y. So basically this is one if together X and Y have an odd number of ones and zero if together X and Y have an even number of ones. So just like equality, we can have the trivial uh, protocol, trivial n plus one bit protocol. Alice could send her entire input X to Bob and Bob could respond with a zero one answer. But however, there is a better protocol, right? That uses even lesser bits. Alice can just check how many uh, bits are there with her, right? She doesn't even need to send the count of the number of bits. Instead, she can send the parity of her bits whether she has an odd number of ones or zero, uh, even number of ones. And Bob also can send Alice whether he has an odd number of ones or zero num uh, even number of ones. So basically each one of them is sending one bit that indicates whether they have an odd number of ones or an even number of ones to each other. And once, uh, so the parity function is just the XR of these two put together. If both Alice and Bob have an odd number of ones, then together they have an even number of ones. So the parity function is zero. If exactly one of them have an odd number of ones, then the parity function is one. If both of them have an even number of ones, then again, the parity function is zero. So the, the, this protocol uses only two bits. So just exactly like we said, upper bound of n plus one, this gives us an upper bound of two. And this is actually equality because uh, without any communication, like with, with one bit of communication, uh, it is not possible to compute parity, right? With one bit, only Alice or Bob will be able to send that. And it's impossible to determine whether the parity is odd or even, right? Because whatever Bob has will never be known to Alice if Alice is the one sending. So the, the deterministic complexity of parity is actually equal to two. Um, another, uh, uh, this is an exercise. So I'll just describe the problem. The problem is, uh, average. So basically Alice gets a set S and Bob gets a set T, right? Uh, so both of them are subsets of one, two, three up to N, right? So, and um, the average is the average of the multi-set S union T. Okay. So multi-set, which means that I am allowing repetitions. S and T are normal sets, which do not have repetitions, but S union T is the multi-set union, which means I am allowing the repetitions. So if S, for instance, S is one, two, five, and T is one, two, four, six, then the multiset has one, one, two, two, four, five, six, right? So the average of this multi, so one and one appear two times, one and two appear two times because one appears both, two appears two times, four, five, and six appear only once. The average of this multiset is the total number of sum of the elements divided by the total number of elements because one and two repeat two times, it is uh, seven elements. So you can easily count. This is uh, six plus 15, which is 21 divided by seven. So the average of the, the average function for this is three, 21 divided by seven. So this is an exercise. Please come up with the protocol for average. Okay, uh, another, uh, another uh, function is median, right? So you know median, median is like if you arrange the numbers in increasing or decreasing order or the sorted order, what is the value that comes in the uh, middle, right? So again, S and T are sets like before. Uh, so now I'll just describe, this is not exercise, I'll descri describe the, uh, so again, this is something that uh, you should probably uh, think about. If S and T are subsets of one to N, I can equivalently write, uh, have a, uh, a representation in terms of binary strings. For instance, uh, 
for instance let's say 110110 let's say 5 bit has a correspondence with the set 1 3 4 because the first bit and third bit and the fourth bit are ones and two second and fifth bit are zeros so the um there is a correspondence between n length binary strings and the subsets of size n subsets of 1 2 3 up to n anyway so let us see again that's an aside uh, let us see how to how alice and bob can determine the median of course there is always a trivial algorithm alice can send the entire set which is n bits and then bob can send uh, the median so the median will, will be a number from 1 to n so to describe the number it will take log n bits so n plus log n but we will see a better algorithm so this algorithm is a is a kind of variation on binary search so what alice and bob can do is to have an understanding or a range or an interval i comma j within which the median should lie so to begin with the i comma j will be 1 comma n because the median should lie within from 1 to n because both of the the sets are from this that range then what alice does is alice divides the range into half so initially it will be n plus 1 by 2 and alice sends bob the number of elements above the middle and number of elements below the middle so now bob gets how many number number of elements are above the middle how many are below the middle and of course he has access to his full set so he knows how many are above and how many are below in his part and he knows how many are above and how many are below in alice's part and now he can tell he can tell uh, whether uh, which side is it above i plus j by 2 or below i plus j by 2 has more number of elements whichever side has more number of elements the median will be in that right so based on that uh bob will tell alice whether the median is above i plus j by 2 or below i plus j by 2 this can be done just using by just by using one bit because he just has to say whether it is a binary output right whether it's above or below whereas alice has to send the number of elements above and below and to send the number of elements it takes since the set is a subset of 1 to n the number of elements will be at most n so this takes log n uh, many bits right log n plus log n so maybe two log n but actually i think it will be just log n because both of these cannot be log n but let's take a simple upper bound of two log n is what it takes here and two one bit is what it takes here and now once bob sends the uh, uh, whether the median is above or below then both of them know to redefine the ranges so right if it is if if the if the median is known to be below then we replace the upper interval upper end point j will be replaced by i plus j by 2 if the median is known to be above i plus j by 2 then i will be replaced by i plus j by 2 and we also know uh, um how many ele which which at element we should look for right both of them know how many elements are below suppose the the uh, the median is above above the i plus j by 2 so i is replaced by i plus j by 2 i also know both of them know both alice and bob know how many elements are or not both alice and bob bob knows how many elements are below so now alice will again divide into half and then tell bob how many are below and how many are above and this can continue again i'm skipping a bit of details how many rounds will it take so the initial interval is 1 comma n and every time we are splitting that interval into half there are only n elements in that interval so we will be able to split it into half at most log n many times and every time we already saw that log n is the 2 uh, log n plus 2 or 2 2 log n plus 1 or something is the number of bits that is communicated so log n many rounds plus uh communication of constant log n each round gives you order log square n. Right, log n multiplied by log n. So this is a this is a very non-trivial algorithm, unlike the other non-trivial protocol, unlike the other ones that we have seen. Right. Um, every time we send the number, and then Bob tells you the median where the position of the median is, and then you do a binary search. In fact, this 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 problem interestingly has a 
even better algorithm log n algorithm exists but that is uh, that will take more time for us to explain hence this is an since this is an introductory lecture i'm not going into that okay now let us try to see what is called uh, um, some techniques to understand uh, communication complexity so most of communication complexity we'll try to uh, show bounds on the complexity so this will be a tool that will help us so this will be a representation of the protocol okay what is called protocol tree so basically this is a representation of the protocol so suppose alice sends first let us say let us say she computes a function called au first and if if au is zero bob sends a function called bv if au is one maybe alice again continues to send right it is possible based on what alice first sends the understanding could differ if she sends a zero bob will know that it is his turn to respond if she sends a one then bob will know that it is alice's turn still right now alice uh, again sends let's say if she comes this way alice sends computes another function aw and then sends a zero bob sends another function and these leaves the the, the labels of the leaves indicate they have computed the function to be zero this indicates they computed the function to be one one so aq means again alice is going to send something again this tree is not done so the depth this is for a specific protocol we will again see some of the protocols that we have seen we will we'll, we'll give an example so the depth of the tree is uh, the depth of the protocol pi is the height of this tree right that is the maximum number of bits that is communicated right so when you draw it like a binary tree it is the height of the tree that is the cost of the protocol that is the path that is the of the longest depth from the root to leaf and what we are interested in uh, for a, a specific uh, function is to find the tree that is of the lowest height right that is the min that was outside uh, and the max that is inside corresponds to the depth the, the largest path the longest path from root to leaf so since we uh, just to understand let us see the uh, tree for equality one tree for equality let's say equality of uh, two bits alice has an input of two bits bob has an input of two bits let's say x1 x2 is in alice's input and y1 y2 is bob's input so the first alice could just send her leading bit x1 if it is zero it comes here if it is one it goes here now bob could send y1 right and if alice's first bit is zero and bob's first bit is one we already know without getting into the second bits that these two uh, values are not equal right right if alice's first bit is zero and bob's first bit is one we know that they are not equal so we could immediately output that it is a no similarly if alice's first bit is one and bob's first bit is zero however if alice's and bob's first bit agree let's say they are both zero then we need to look at the second bits so again we could alice could send her second first second bit and then bob could send his second bit if they are the same then we say, say yes if they are different then they say no again they are different they say no they are different they are same they say yes we could have a similar uh, subtree here as well so you see what is happening right this subtree there will be four leaves here four leaves here and there are two leaves here so there are 10 leaves overall uh in this protocol tree right and the height of the protocol tree is of course 4 right and we know this is not the best because of course alice there is a protocol of uh, height 3 right alice could send x1 x2 to bob and bob could just respond by 0 1 so that alice sends 2 and bob just sends 1 bit this is not the best uh, protocol but this is one example i just want to illustrate something okay now we will so we i already we already saw that uh, equality can be done in n plus 1 bits right alice sends everything to bob and bob sends a 0 1 bit reply now we will show that equality this is kind of the best equality requires n bits how do we how will we show that we will show that the tree has depth at least n right because the depth of the tree or the height of the tree is the cost of the protocol so any 
any protocol that computes equality, the tree should have height uh, at least n is what we will show. And how will we show that? We will show that by showing that the tree has to have 2 power n leaves. If it has 2 power n leaves, it cannot be, uh, it cannot be a tree of height less than n. It should have at least n, leaf, n, n height for it to have 2 power n leaves. Right? So we will show that the tree has at least 2 power n leaves. Okay. So here uh, one thing to note is that in this protocol tree, we were computing equality over two two bit long inputs. So you see that when x is uh, 0, 0, right? So what are the, so what are the, let's try to understand, let me just try to draw, what are the inputs that come to this, this leftmost leaf? The only input is when x is uh, 0, 0 and y is 0, 0, we get here. And here, what are the inputs that come here? X is 0, 0 and Y is 0, 1. And here X is uh, 0, 1 and Y is 0, 0. And here X is 0, 1 and Y is 0, 1. Right? That's why they are equal. So it's a yes. Something similar will happen here as well. I'm not writing that down. But let's take this particular no node and try to write down the uh, the, 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 the inputs that lead here. So actually there are multiple inputs. X could be anything that starts with a 0, 0, 0 or 0, 1. And Y could be anything that starts with a 1, 1, 0 or 1, 1. And between these there are four input combinations possible that lead, lead to this leaf. I'm talking about this leaf, right. So, the point is that, that I'm saying is that uh, there are uh, there are two bit inputs. So Alice and Bob uh, together there are there are uh, each can have four input input possibilities. So together they can have sixteen input combinations. However, out of the sixteen, some many input combinations come here. Four input combinations appear here, but these leaves uh, only have single in, correspond to single in, input combinations, right? So I'm just illustrating what, what, can, what is happening here. So let us try to understand why I'm doing this. So this will be, this is useful uh, in understanding this proof. So we want to show that the tree has at least two power n leaves. So what is the total combination of inputs? We know that the total combination of inputs is two power n inputs that Alice could have, two power n inputs that Bob could have. So 2 power 2n inputs are possible and we are going to show that the, the tree has at least 2 power n leaves. So this needs some, some explanation because it is possible that many input combinations merge and we could end up in a tree with, with let's say 2 power n by 2 leaves, right. But this is going to show that that kind of merging cannot happen beyond a part. So we know that for all x, equality of x comma x is 1, right. So let's consider uh, two input pairs. So here x1 and x1 is an input string, entire input string, not a single bit. Uh, suppose x1 is an input string, x2 is an input string. Uh, so equality of x1, x1 will is equal to one, right? Because Alice and Bob both have x1 and equality of x2, x2 is also equal to one. So both have one. So this could potentially come to the same leaf, right? L. Uh, because both of them say equal. But it follows, what we will show is that if this happens, if one input pair x1, x1 and x2, x2 come to the same leaf. So here 0, 0 came to the same leaf, 0, 0, 1, 0 came to the same leaf, 0, 0, 1, 1 came to the same leaf, right. Uh, what we are going to show here is that if x1, x1 and x2, x2 came to the same leaf, then x1, x2 must also come to the same leaf. But this is not, uh, this cannot happen because equality of x1, x1 is 1, equality of x2, x2 is 1, but equality of x1, x2 is 0 because x1 and x2 are two different values. So the, the leaf will have a yes or no label saying that this is equal or this is not equal. So if x1, x1 ends up here and x2, x2 ends up here, the label will be yes, these are equal. 
but then you cannot send an x1 x2 pair here here it was okay because all the pairs possible 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 1 1 0 sorry 0 1 1 0 and 0 1 1 1 all of them are distinct so it's okay all the pairs are fine all the pairs are no but we cannot combine yes pairs and no pairs to a same leaf because the leaf is supposed to just say yes or no answer but what we are saying here is that or what we'll soon see is that if x1 x1 and x2 x2 go to the same leaf then x1 x2 also must go to the same leaf right if x1 uh, this is because um, okay so we'll come to that a bit later but um, in a moment but this leaf is labeled uh, one right so x1 x2 cannot go to a leaf labeled one because equal equality function of x1 x2 is zero so this means that each of these x each of these values each of these pairs x1 x1 x2 x2 must all go to different leaves because any two of them goes to the same leaf there is a problem so that means each distinct pair x1 x1 x2 x2 etc they all should go to different leaves so the, how many x's are possible like this there are two power n x's possible so each of these two power n x's must go to different leaves so that means that the number of leaves should be at least two power n and this implies that the height is at least n okay now let us see a bit more explanation as to why this is the case so this is the same thing restated if in any protocol protocol x1 so this is a bit more general general than written here x1 y1 and x2 y2 go to the same leaf then x basically x1 y2 basically the, the x coordinate from here and the y coordinate from here or the x coordinate from here and the y coordinate from here must also go to the same leaf so which is how it is happening here see here 0 0 1 0 goes to this leaf 0 1 1 1 also goes to this leaf but then 0 0 1 1 also is going, coming to this leaf and 0 1 1 0 is also coming to the same leaf so this cross product kind of things are also coming to the same leaf and that's all this claim that's all what this claim is saying why is this true so suppose this is not the case suppose x1 y sub, so assume that x1 y1 and x2 y2 go to the same leaf l and x1 y2 does not go to the same leaf so that means that it must uh, it goes to some other leaf which means that it must deviate right so uh, there must be some way uh, in which right i will just draw this with a pencil so suppose this is a leaf where x1 y1 and x2 y2 have reached this means that now suppose x1 y2 goes to some other leaf let us say it goes to some other leaf over here now this means that at this point it deviated right x1 y2 deviated started from the same root root everything the trees it has the same root and here it deviated why did it deviate here let us try to understand let us see who has to speak here either alice will send something to bob or bob will send something to alice suppose alice is the one who spoke right but look at what what is happening here alice knows her input and the fact that they are here right? the protocol has guided both of them to be at this point right now if if the situation was x1 y1 alice goes this way but when it is x1 y2 why is alice deviating because alice does not know what bob's input is alice knows only whatever bob's uh, enough of bob's input to know that they have reached this stage this particular state so alice has no idea of bob's input except that she has reached this point so whether regardless of whether bob has y1 or y2 if alice has x1 here she will only move based on what x1 says which is this one she will not go this way similarly if this was bob's if this was bob's turn to speak here he only knows his input he only knows that his input is y2 so if but then x2 y2 led bob to go this down this way if he was to speak here 
he went this way for x2 y2 now it doesn't matter what alice has alice has x2 or x1 because he doesn't know that he only knows enough about alice's input that to to tell him that they have reached here together right so regardless of whether alice's input is x1 or x2 if he has y2 he will go down this way he cannot deviate so the point that i am saying is that regardless of whatever um, alice uh, whoever is supposed to speak here alice or bob they will have to follow the same path as x1 y1 and x2 y2 and end up at the same leaf so if x1 y1 and x2 y2 go to the same leaf then x1 y2 and x2 y1 also must go to the same leaf the the situation that is depicted here this cannot happen this cannot happen right and that is what is said in the claim here so consider the earliest place where they deviate and at this point alice cannot distinguish again i explain more than what is written over here okay now let us try to understand another function uh, called set disjoinness right so this is two um, both alice and bob have n long binary strings and it's a binary function so the, the z is a 0 1 so i already mentioned there is a correspondence between n length binary strings and subsets of 1 2 3 up to n right so equivalently we could ask is this alice and bob have the uh, um, uh, have disjoint sets so for instance let us maybe just take one example so let's say alice has 1 0 1 1 and bob has 1 0 0 0 right so the first one corresponds to the set 1 3 4 second one corresponds to set just set one is this disjoint of course not both of them have one so set disjointness just is asking this question whether they are disjoint or not another way of asking disjointness just purely without going to sets is look at these vectors let's call this x and let's call this y does there exist uh, or is it the case that for all in the indices i one of them is zero so when when is it not when is it disjoint it is disjoint when there are no common ones like this we are what we are saying is that for each i either x x i equal to zero or y i must be equal to zero if that is the case we say it is disjoint otherwise we say it is not disjoint so we are asking whether it is disjoint or not here it will say it is not disjoint because for the uh, for the first uh, index, first coordinate, first index, neither x y x i nor y i are zero. Both of them are one. Right. So that is the that is the only complement condition here. There exists an i such that x i is one and y i is one, which means there is an intersecting coordinate. Set disjointness happens to be a very uh, uh, very kind of uh, holds a very important place in the uh, theory of communication complexity. It is in some ways like SAT, uh, the position SAT holds in NP completeness theory because uh, many uh, problems, uh, set disjointness happens to uh, many, many different models, classes, etc. Set, dis set disjointness captures the difficulty and it is considered as a uh, significantly uh, hard problem. Right? So, set disjointness is um, a very important problem. And I'll just say that. that uh, it's, it's, I'm not giving a proof, but you can work out this if you're curious. The deterministic complexity of disjoint is actually linear. You need to exchange, of course, the trivial algorithm that is, is there that uses n, n plus one communication. That is, in, in fact, is necessary. Necessary, okay. Okay, right. Now, let me introduce another notion called this, uh, this matrix. So basically, I'm okay. Maybe once I explain the matrix, you will understand. So this is uh, this is a matrix that corresponds to the function. Okay, let's. So what is this this function? This function says that x and y together have at least four ones. Okay, x and y together have at least four ones. So for a moment, please uh, ignore these subdivision etc. Just look at the 
the, the row indices and column indices and the value. So this is just a function value. So let's take an example. X is 0, 1, 1, which means X has two ones. When Y is all zeros, the function is zero because together they have only two ones. When Y is 0, 0, 1, together they have only three ones, so the function is zero. When Y is 0, 1, 0, together they have three ones, so the function is zero. When y is 0, 1, 1, together they have four ones, so the function is 1. When y is 1, 0, 1, the function is 1. When y is 1, 1, 0, the function is 1. When y is 1, 1, 1, together they have five ones, so again the function is 1. Um, for instance, when x is all ones, when x has three ones, whenever y is not all 0, right, at, y has at least one one, the function value is 1. The only case when uh, y, uh, the function value is 0 is when y is all 0. So like that I can enter the, for each x and y combination, I enter the function value. I get a matrix like this. And this matrix is very uh, helpful. So like the protocol tree, or um, this is a bit different because the protocol tree is, um, corresponds to a protocol. The matrix just corresponds to the function because there is no protocol that we are talking about, it's just the function. The matrix is very helpful in trying to understand the function. So let's try to understand, uh, look at now a protocol for this function. Again, the function is together X and Y have four ones. Okay. So one way is could be that Alice knows X and Bob knows Y. So Alice could first uh, send uh, a binary uh, uh, bit to Bob indicating whether she has 0 or 1 1 or 2 or 3 ones. So if it has 0 or 1 1 she would send she would come this way or she could send this way. Right? And now if Alice has sent Bob that she has 0 or 1 ones then Bob says whether he has 0 1 or 2 ones or he has 3 ones. If Bob has 0 or not 2 ones then the function value is de decided already. It is zero because together they have at most three ones. If he says he has three ones, then it depends on whether Alice has zero one or she has one one. If, he, if she has zero ones, the function value is zero. If she has one one, the function value is one because together they will have four ones. Similarly, the other side of the tree is if Alice has two or three ones, X has two or three ones, one possibility is Alice could send a follow-up bit indicating whether she has two ones or three ones. If Alice says she has two ones, so this side of the tree is not really symmetric, it's a bit different. Again, um, if Bob has more than uh, two or three ones, the function value is one. If Bob has zero or one ones, the function value is zero. Similarly, when X has three ones, if uh, Bob has zero ones, then the function value is zero. If Bob has uh, uh, one, two or three ones, then the function value is one because together they have at least four ones. Right, so now uh, let us try to understand how this, um, so now how many leaves are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we know that there are uh, uh, eight times eight, 64 entries. Right. So let us see how this some of these, uh, these leaves are uh, collecting or gathering some inputs. So let us take this leaf which is uh, circled with a blue square. We reach this leaf when X has exactly two ones and Y has two or three ones. Which is exactly the part that I have encircled here or uh, marked here with uh, blue square. X has two ones, so which is 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 1, 0, right? And Y has two or three ones, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. And similarly, the green part is X has two ones and Y has 0 or 1 ones. So X has two ones is already here. Y has 0 ones or 1 ones is this green part. And uh, the highlighted by yellow is when sorry is when x has three ones and y has one two or three ones x has three ones which is just the last row and y has one two or three ones the highlight by yellow part 
So one thing that you can note here is that there is some pattern, right? So the, if you just look at the, the blue part, the part that is put in the blue squares, together they form, like if I, if I just rearrange the rows and columns, I can put them together and they will form like a rectangle, right? If I just uh, swap these two columns, then I could have this, and then maybe I could swap these two rows, then I will have uh, all the green part as a rectangle, all the blue part as another rectangle, right? So, and even the, the highlighted yellow part, that is already a rectangle. So the point here is that, and uh, so what I'm saying is that up to the ordering of rows and columns, what we are having here is already a rectangle. So we are studying what are the points that reaches this leaf. And it seems to be these uh, uh, four times three, 12 points that reach that leaf. And they happen to be in a rectangle form. So what is happening here? So everything that is, uh, so when you start off, you could be anywhere in this, in this matrix, right? When you say X is zero or one, one, or X is two or three ones, basically you are saying that I am going to be either in the rows zero, uh, like zero, one, two, or four, or rows three, five, six, or seven. So basically I'm saying which rows can I be or which rows I'm not in. And, and similarly, again, Bob is uh, saying which rows he could be or which rows he's not in. So basically Alice and Bob through communication are narrowing down there, where the, their scope. And finally, at the end, we see that for all these green squares or blue squares, they say the answer. So you also notice that all these blue squares, they have the answer one. So all these blue entries go to the same leaf and they can go to the same leaf because all of them correspond to the value one. And all these green entries go to the same leaf and they can go because they correspond to the value zero. We cannot have a leaf which say which, which says zero in some cases and one in some other cases. Okay. Right, so, um, so is this a co coincidence that in this case, uh, the, the blue, uh, the leaf corresponds to what looks like a rectangle and, the, and this leaf also corresponds to what looks like a rectangle? Answer is no, uh, this is not a coincidence. In fact, in any protocol, any protocol tree, in fact, all these nodes correspond to rectangles and the leaves correspond to what is called monochromatic rectangles. Monochromatic means the function values should be same in the leaves. So here the function in the green leaf or this leaf, the function value is all zeros. And you can see that the function value is all zeros. So, um, so this concept is called combinatorial rectangle, right? Because we call it combinatorial because this is a rectangle in the logical sense. It is not a rectangle in the, like they are not uh, like a rectangle in the geometric sense because they are not adjacent to each other, but it's a up to some reordering, it is a rectangle. So it's called a combinatorial rectangle. So that is the next definition. A combinatorial rectangle is just a Cartesian product of two sets. So it's a combinatorial, R is a combinatorial rectangle. If it is, it can be written as A cross B, where A is a subset of uh, X and B is a subset of Y. So so this, this checks out. Uh, the point is that you cannot have, you cannot have something like this. This cannot be a combinatorial rectangle because if you project it, the X projection looks like this and the Y projection looks like this. So this part is not uh, included. So a combinatorial, a real combinatorial rectangle would have looked like this. You could also have some things like this, for instance, this is still a combinatorial rectangle, right? So it is, it should be a Cartesian product of uh, X, A cross B, where A is a subset of X and B is a subset of Y, right? And it's very easy to see that uh, if it is a combinatorial rectangle, right? So you can see it's kind of a rectangle then. 
if x1 x2 is in the rectangle and x2 y2 sorry x1 y1 is in the rectangle and x2 y2 is also in the rectangle then the cross term x1 y2 also has to be in a rectangle one uh, easy way of seeing it is suppose this is x1 y1 and suppose this is x2 y2 then basically this cross term x1 y2 or x2 y1 this will also be in the rectangle right that's what it means and even this should be in the rectangle right otherwise like uh, otherwise it's not a rectangle right so this is an if and only if thing the one direction is easy if it is a rectangle then these two will be there and suppose and the other thing is interesting thing is if this condition is met, met then it is a rectangle so to check whether it is a rectangle uh, it is enough if to check whether this condition holds uh, this uh, I, you can just uh, so the, the proof is easy suppose this is this condition is true then let set a to be this set of all the x that feature in r and b to be the set of all y that feature in r and then uh, you can check that r is uh, capital r is indeed a cross b okay so why are, why are we talking about this combinatorial rectangles uh, what happened just one second yeah, why are we talking about this combinatorial rectangles uh, because this hold an important place in the communication complexity so the result is that in any protocol by this i have already mentioned every node in the tree is a combinatorial rectangle and all the leaves are monochromatic rectangles and this proof i am not proving but it's very similar to the reasoning that we did in the proof that uh, like it's exactly like this 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 claim here is exactly this claim here so the point is that um, every node is a rectangle so what is this node this node means it's the starting point the entire matrix is this the entire matrix is of course of course a rectangle it's x cross y and every decision actually refines the rectangle either it it, it splits the rectangle scope by rows or by columns so every node is a rectangle further every leaf is a monochromatic rectangle so maybe we'll just check one more what is this rectangle what is this leaf correspond to x has 0 or 1 1 y has 0 1 or 2 ones so 0 or 1 1 is uh, this 3 and the fourth column um, sorry 0 1 2 3 and sorry 0 1 2 and fourth column and uh, y has 0 1 2 ones so which means uh, all but the last uh, uh, last row so this entire part is a rectangle and this this part so the claim is that in any protocol just one second every node is a combinatorial rectangle and all the leaves are monochromatic combinatorial rectangles so when i say f monochromatic it meaning monochromatic as per f the f computes the same value Again, this proof is similar to that. You can read up and try to follow. So now this gives us a way to lower bound the communication complexity. Why? You take any partition of X cross Y. Suppose now any protocol has to divide it into monochromatic rectangles. Right? That's what it has to do because we know that the leaves are monochromatic rectangles. So what is the smallest number of ways by which we can divide this thing into monochromatic rectangles? Suppose for a function, it requires T such rectangles. That means the, T ha the tree has to have, the tree has to have at least T leaves. So which means the tree has to have height log T. Right? So in any partition of X cross Y into monochromatic rectangles, require at least t rectangles then the complexity is at least log t because this means that tree has to have at least t number of leaves so finally we'll just see one more uh, example we'll show that disjointness uh, requires 
a complexity of n right of course we have always have the trivial protocol of n plus 1 so consider the the pair or the set that consists of the following strings x and its complement string so so which means it could be uh, things like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, sorry, uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on, right? So there are eight x's, there are two power n x, two power n x's possible here, and same number of x complement. So the size of s is two power n, right? And um, what we will show is that each of these must go to a different leaf. Two of these cannot go to the same leaf. And hence, since there are two power n of them, that, that means we have to have two power n leaves. And hence, uh, that means that uh, the complexity is at least log of two power n, which is n. Okay, let's see why that is the case. First of all, each one of them, uh, the, they are disjoint, right? Because it's a complement by definition, they will be disjoint. 0, 0, 0 is disjoint with 1, 1, 1. 0, 0, 1 is disjoint with 1, 1, 0. Now, if consider two pairs in S, x, x bar and y, y bar, right? Now, it has to be the case that either x and y bar are not disjoint or y and x bar are not disjoint. So this follows because x and y are not equal. So either x contains an element that is not there in y or y contains an element that is not there in x. So if x contains an element that is not there in y, then this will not be empty. Otherwise, otherwise this will not be empty. So just think about it, why you will understand why this one of them will not be, one pair will not be disjoint. This means x and x bar are disjoint, y and y bar are disjoint and at least one of them, x bar and y or x and y bar, at least one of them has to be, uh, has to be intersecting and will not be disjoint. So this entry or this entry will be zero. It's possible that both of these can be zero, but we know for sure that at least one of them have to be zero. What does this tell us? This tells us that this entire thing cannot be in one rectangle because one of them have to be zero. So this, uh, they, they can be in one rectangle, but that rectangle cannot be a monochromatic rectangle. So it cannot be a rectangle at a leaf. Hence, uh, each one of this, each one of the elements in each one of the pairs in uh, each one of the pairs in X, right? S. These pairs should go to uh, distinct rectangles. Hence, uh, they should go to separate rectang rectangles. And because of that, just one second. Yeah, because of that, uh, then uh, all of the elements of X should go to separate rectangles. And because of that, there, sh there should be as many rectangles or as many leaves as as much as uh, there are number of uh, elements in S. So there has to be at least two power n leaves. That means the height has to be at least log of two power n, which is n. And this is an example of an argument called fooling set argument. So fooling set uh, argument um, basically invo involves showing that taking a number of elements all of which have to be in different uh, leaves. Again, I don't want to get into the details because it's not a course entirely on communication complexity. And there are other argument techniques uh, using size of the matrix, size of the rectangles, rank of the matrix, um, other things like discrepancy. Uh, there are so many other techniques used, but we don't have time to go into all of that. Um, I just quickly mention about a uh, rank so we have this, this matrix that we defined, right? 
this matrix. For 0, 1 functions, we could talk about the rank of this matrix. And the rank of this matrix of the over reals sometimes is referred to as the rank of f because it's the rank of the matrix that is created by f, but sometimes there is a notation abuse and referred to as rank of f. And it is not difficult to show that the deterministic communication complexity of f is lower bounded by the log rank and upper bounded by the rank, rank plus one. Okay. So basically this, but this is a very wide gap lower bound by the log rank and so this is like rank is exponential of log, log rank right so this is not much this is a very big range and one of the most famous uh, conjectures in communication complexity is called log rank conjecture which says that deterministic communication complexity is upper bounded by some constant power of log rank so df is constant power of log rank but we are not even this is a conjecture that has been there for some time but it has not been shown to be true the best thing that we know know is uh, communication complexity is upper bound by square root of rank multiplied by log rank so the square root itself is such a huge thing so imagine how bad we are and uh, what we know is that this c has to be at least 1.58 there are instances where the DFS requires uh, is at least this much log rank of f to the power 1.58. Right. <coughs> so I just quickly summarize. So we saw what is communication complexity, Yao's model, what is a protocol, some examples, equality, parity, average, and median. Um, the exercise one was to come up with a protocol for average. We defined what is protocol tree. Uh, we saw some examples. Then we showed uh, that deterministic complexity of equality is at least n by using this kind of argument, uh, uh, where we said that x1, x1, and x2, x2 go to the same leaf, then x1, x2 must also go to the same leaf. And this idea was used to uh, used further in defining what is called combinatorial rectangles. Right. Um, we defined set disjoinness. We saw this matrix, uh, which is defined based on the function. And we saw this, uh, the combinatorial rectangles in action. So, and we saw that in any protocol, all the uh, in any protocol tree, all the nodes correspond to rectangles, and all the leaves correspond to monochromatic combinatorial rectangles, like the green uh, surrounded leaf uh, rectangle uh, values all correspond to one leaf. The blue all correspond to another leaf, right? And uh, the, we saw two characterizations for sorry, just one second. We saw two characterizations for combinatorial rectangle. One is that it's a rectangle, uh, which means it's, it can be written as A cross B for two sets A and B. Or the second characterization is that for all X1, Y1 in the rectangle and X2, Y2 in the rectangle, X1, Y2 must also be in the rectangle. This is not very difficult to see. Then we got this bound that, uh, yeah, then we got this bound that if any division of the matrix into monochromatic rec rectangles uh, require at least t rectangles, then the communication complexity is at least log t. We saw the fooling set uh, argument for disjoinness that we showed that it requires two power n rectangles. Then we saw uh, when we, then we saw the log uh, the bound involving the rank, rank of f is the rank of the matrix over reals. We saw that deterministic complexity is lower bounded by log rank and upper bounded by rank. And finally, the log rank conjecture states that deterministic complexity is upper bounded by log rank to the power some constant. <coughs> Just to clarify, it's still a conjecture and we don't know whether it is true or not. Finally, one more exercise. Um, the greater than function, which I uh, denoted by gt of n is just uh, gt of xy is uh, 1 if x greater than y and 0 if x is less than or equal to y. 
the problem is to determine the deterministic communication complexity of this function. Okay, with that I stop this uh, introduction to communication complexity.